Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Connor, and welcome back to another St. Louis Zoom webinar. I'm so happy to have um, all of our participants here today, and I'm so excited to be talking about our program, which is Zoo Busters. Now, that program is going to be a lot about um, some of the animals that a lot of us consider kind of scary, maybe creepy crawly, or even dangerous. Um, we'll be talking about a lot of different uh, myths and kind of fears involved in animals and why some of them are kind of based on silly stories and things like that. But before we go into that, I'm going to go ahead and share our um, Zoom guidelines. Now, if you've watched a webinar with us before, you've probably seen this slide already, and I apologize for going through this one more time, but we'll make it pretty brief. Um, now, we do have a chat box today. If you haven't found it yet, it should be in your black bar menu, either in the top or the bottom of your screen. Um, that's a great way to kind of stay involved in the program. I'll be able to see everything that you all say. Um, just remember that we want to stay appropriate and respectful to one another when we use that chat box. We also have a Q&A box on that same menu. That's a great place to put any questions you have about today's program. Um, now, I'll be able to go through all of those questions at the end of today's program. Um, we also want to remember that we do have a moderator today in the webinar. Her name is Kim, and she's helping me monitor the chat and also um, go through some of the logistics of the slide. So thank you, Kim, for being my moderator today. Now remember, she may ask you to alter your behavior in the chat if we aren't being respectful of one another. And if she does ask that, she does have the power to remove you from the webinar as well. So just keep that in mind. Um, now, if you would like to go ahead before we get started, let us know where you're calling in from and how many people are calling in with you. That's a great way to help us know who and where we are reaching. Um, and remember, use that Q&A box if you have any questions during the program. We want to stay close to the topic of conversation. I'd love to answer all your questions about the zoo all day, but we're going to focus on just zoo busters today. Um, and at the very end, we will have a poll that gives uh, you an opportunity to give me feedback on how we're doing. And that poll is very helpful for us, again, to let us know how we're doing and what we can do better. So if you wouldn't mind filling that out at the very end, that would be very helpful to us as well. Okay, well, I'm so excited to get started. Now, one of my favorite topics of conversation are animals that people consider scary. And that might seem a little silly, but it's because animals to me are are not scary or, or anything else. They're not trying to be scary. They're just trying to survive. Animals have their adaptations to help them live. So when we see animals that we fear, it tends to be things that we misunderstand or maybe we associate with these animals. I'm gonna need a lot of participation from the chat. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up my chat box so I can see what you're saying. I see we have some people from Quincy and St. Louis. Okay, wonderful. Now I'm going to go ahead and explain that we'll talk a little bit about animals and then we're going to go into a quiz. And what that means is we're going to see some slides that give three hints about what this animal might be. And we're all going to have to try to guess in the chat. So remember to set your chat to all panelists and attendees so everybody can see each other's answers. And that way we'll be able to share what we think our animal guesses are later on. So keep that in mind. Now, today we're going to talk a lot about what animals people are afraid of. So if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and put in the chat an animal maybe you are afraid of, or maybe a friend of yours uh, might be a little afraid of. I know my sister, my own sister, um, is horrified of snakes. She has a big problem being in the same room as snakes. As a, a zoo employee who handles snakes regularly, this is kind of a funny sibling difference between us. Okay, I see snake, spider, chimpanzee. Sure, yeah. A lot of animals that we might be fearful of. Maybe we don't have a lot of experience or maybe we do have experience and it was a negative one. So I'm going to go ahead and click on my PowerPoint and I show a few pictures of animals that are common ones um, that we've heard of. I see frogs in the chat. Spiders was one we already said. Bats is one we hear quite a bit. They're animals of the night, so a lot of darkness and scariness associated. Vultures tend to be associated with things that are gross like dead animals. Not exactly a, a cuddly, furry friend like we picture a puppy or something like that, right? But all of these animals have the same um, reason to be around, to, to survive. So all of their traits help them survive. They have adaptations. The snake is a great one. This one is a harmless milk snake, but it looks like a venomous one. So we associate it with a lot of danger. 
and this is a rat. Rats and rodents are associated with a lot of disease and teeth, so typically one that people can be nervous around. I see hippopotamus and sharks in the chat as well. Those are some good answers. Definitely some animals that can be dangerous. Absolutely. So now the question is why? Why are we afraid of some animals more than others? Because we know things like earthworms are pretty harmless and they're about the same shape as a snake. But when we see something a little bit bigger and a little bit scalier, it can make people afraid. Or maybe we love fuzzy dogs and cats, but a, a small rodent can make us jump on a table. Oh, I see we met someone that didn't like owls as well. Okay, sure. Now, what I see is a lot of movies and pop culture making us fearful. Things that are maybe exaggerated animals that are movie animals. They're not real by any means, but their features have been exaggerated. Maybe they've been blown up in size and increasing uh, in their danger or something like that. Now, all of these pictures are animals that acted more aggressively than they normally would and attacked people with larger teeth than they normally would have and, and bigger muscles and bigger bodies than normal. So these are all things that give us an impression of these animals being scarier than they need, than they need to be. Things like even Harry Potter exaggerates the snake into the huge basilisk monster that even when blinded can find you in pitch darkness with its scaly tongue and all these scary features that remind us of even the small snakes. And of course, the acromantula, the giant tarantulas that were in Harry Potter as well could make us a little more fearful of that tiny little cellar spider we find in our basement. <laughs> Um, the Hunger Games is another great example of some mutated and exaggerated, almost alien-like versions of animals. So we're going to go ahead and start with our first quiz. Um, now, before we start, let me just remind us that we're going to have three clues for each. So I'll read through those clues. We can have a few moments to take some guesses as to what we think they are. Maybe I'll read through a few of those options and we'll move on to reveal what animal we're talking about. So this first animal is an animal that is worldly. It lives everywhere that humans live. So everywhere you can find a human, you can find this animal too. This animal is helpful. It breaks down plant matter into, uh, and it returns the nutrients back into the soil. So remember, if you've attended any of my webinars before, I talk a lot about decomposers, animals that break down dead plants into food for new plants, soil. And this animal is also very clean. They groom themselves constantly. Okay, so do we have any guesses what this animal might be? A cat is a great answer. I love that one. Now, remember, it is a decomposer. I see in the chat we have a reminder there. Hmm. Okay, great guesses. Isopod is a great one. If you've seen roly-poly videos with me, you know that isopods are great decomposers. So let's go ahead and reveal. Ooh, we see worm, millipede. This animal is a cockroach. So believe it or not, cockroaches have been found everywhere that humans are found. They stow away in our boats, in our planes, in our cars very easily, and they make their way around the world and they can adapt to pretty much any environment. So they are surprisingly clean animals. They are grooming themselves constantly. Whenever they stop moving, you might even notice them take their antenna with their little legs and run it through their mouth. What they're doing is actually cleaning themselves. They run their saliva all over their body and it helps um, keep the dirt from sticking onto their body and it helps keep them clean. So surprisingly clean animals and they are also surprisingly helpful. For as many species as we see as pests, there are thousands more that we never see in our homes. Cockroaches normally live outside in the woods just like a lot of beetles would decomposing wood and leaves into soil for other plants. So believe it or not, they are incredibly important decomposers. Um, Kim reminded me that her favorite is the Madagascar hissing cockroach. That is an animal we have at the zoo. That's actually the species pictured um, here on my PowerPoint. And they are beautiful. They are big cockroaches, but they are completely harmless and they love to eat dead plants and nothing else. So as scary as they may seem, they are surprisingly helpful. Now our second animal, is an animal that is a little gross. This one eats its own poop. Now we'll talk a little bit more about that when we reveal the animal, but just know that this is a little, ooh. <laughs> okay, now this animal is also seen as a pest. It destroys crops, okay? 
And this animal is also a little bizarre. It has front teeth that never stop growing. So only its two front teeth on the top and bottom never stop growing. Okay, now what do we think this animal could be? With those three hints, I don't know. Ooh, I hear a rat. Rat is a good answer. Sure, a squirrel. Yeah, maybe a bird even. Absolutely. Great guesses. Okay, so let's go ahead and reveal. We have a, a rabbit. Now, believe it or not, as cute as rabbits are, they do have a habit that we might consider a little gross, and it is called coprophagy. And it is a, a trait that some animals have that allows them to basically digest and pass food and then redigest and pass it again. Now, it's more common in the animal kingdom than you think. And again, as I've talked in my decomposer videos, poop is a natural part of the cycle of nutrients. So I do have a little bit of replica, it's just plastic, but I do have a little bit of fake rabbit poop here. And you can see these are the little jelly beans that you might be familiar with in your backyard or in the park. You may have seen deer uh, scat that looks very similar. Um, surprisingly, deer and rabbit scat is very similar. The rabbits are obviously a little bit smaller. Now, the cool thing about rabbit poop is the first time that they poop it out, it's actually very soft and kind of mushy. Um, and that is what they will eat. It still has a lot of nutrition left in to digest. Because remember, rabbits eat mostly grass in the wild. And if you know anything about cows, you know that cows need four stomachs just to digest all the nutrition out of grass, because there's not a lot of nutrition in grass. But rabbits don't have four stomachs. So what they do is they, di they digest it once, they pass it, and then they eat it, and we call that the vitamin poop. Without access to that vitamin poop, they wouldn't survive because they wouldn't get enough nutrition from their food. So once they digest it that second time, then they can absorb the rest of the nutrition, and it comes out as these drier pellets that we're familiar with. So it is a little gross looking, and maybe the habit seems gross to us, but remember that animals are not scary by nature. They're not trying to be gross or weird. We are the ones that have our own standards of living, and when we see animals with extreme adaptations, it can come off as a little odd. Our next animal is unique. It is the only North American marsupial. Now, some of us might already have a guess from that hint. I thought I saw a message in the chat. Okay. Has more teeth than any other land mammal. Okay, so it has more teeth in its jaws than any other mammal on land. Interesting. And it is resourceful. This animal eats a tremendous variety of food. So it's not a picky eater. It eats all kinds of things. Now with these three hints, what do we think this animal could be? Hmm. Now, if you don't remember what a marsupial is, marsupials are animals that have a pouch in which they can carry their babies. So if in North America, what kind of marsupials do we have? It is an opossum. So opossums are the only marsupial found in North America. These animals do have a small pouch. They carry their babies in for a small time. Although after a certain amount of time, the babies will start to climb out of the pouch and cling onto the back of their mom and follow her around on the ground when they get a little bit more independent as well. They are very cool animals. And there are a lot of poor myths surrounding these animals. A lot of people assume that they are pests and that um, they hang upside down from trees when they sleep. But actually both of those things are wrong. Possums are great animals to have around. They eat a variety of food. They don't eat a whole lot of plant matter. So when people assume they are pests for crops, they actually don't prioritize the crops as much as they do the pests eating the crops. They do eat some small, um, pest animals, um, and they are very well known for eating a lot of ticks. Now, a cool ability that possums have is they have a low body temperature. That low body temperature means that they um, are a little bit confusing to animals that see in thermal vision. They see heat. So when a tick is trying to latch onto an animal, they sense the heat of the animal and they go for the skin, the thinnest skin they can poke into to suck their blood. But when a tick crawls onto a possum, they can't tell where the possum's skin is because their body temperature is kind of cold. So those possums are able to grab and eat those ticks off their fur before they latch on, making them incredible little tick 
eaters and actually one of the main predators for ticks. One possum can eat more than 5,000 ticks a season. So if you have one in your backyard, it might be a good animal to keep around because ticks are not a fun parasite to have. And it's certainly better to have a possum eating all the ticks than the ticks eating us. <laughs> Next one, this is animal number four. This animal is dangerous. It is stronger, two times stronger than the average human male. So remember the average human male is somewhere between 5'8 and about 6'1 um, and typically somewhere between 150 to 190 pounds. So not small people necessarily. Now this animal could be contagious. This animal transmits many diseases to humans. And it also is destructive. If you were to bring this animal home, it might smash a lot of your things. Do we have any guesses on what this animal could be? Ooh, I hear a shark, interesting. Okay, I like that guess. Any other guesses for what this animal could be? Two times stronger than the average human male. Contagious, ooh, I hear polar bear. An ant, interesting, yeah. Ooh, a gorilla. I love it. Okay, let's go ahead. Ooh, a Komodo dragon. Cool. Let's go ahead and reveal. It is a chimpanzee. So chimpanzees are incredibly strong, durable, tough animals. A lot of their social behavior depends on physical um, behaviors. They're not as verbal as us, so they do have to send messages differently. Now that is something that from an outward perspective could seem aggressive or violent. But this is literally their language and their bodies are adapted to take those blows. So they are incredibly strong. They have thicker skin than us and they are very, very destructive animals. They uh, are not exactly known for keeping things neat and tidy, but that's not in any way uh, a slight at them. It's just not in their nature. Now, another thing to note is that they can transmit diseases to humans. Now, chimpanzees and humans are very similar. And as such, they transmit a lot of the same diseases. So it's always a very good idea to remember that, um, especially if you're ever going to visit primates in the wild, something like that. Okay, now our next animal is helpful. This animal helps um, eat animals that humans consider to be pests. So any pest animal that might eat our crops or spread disease to us, this animal can eat, which is pretty cool. This animal is remarkable, they never stop growing. So if you know you've hit a growth spurt recently, maybe you keep your height on a wall, you will keep going for a certain point, but all humans plateau at a certain point and we never get taller than, than our peak height. This animal will keep growing its whole entire life. And this animal is impressive. They can swallow something that is two to three times the size of their own head. Now to put that in perspective, the human head weighs about 20 pounds. So if I were this animal, I would be able to swallow something that weighed about 50 pounds in one bite. Imagine a burrito that was 50 pounds. Oh, and I eat it in one bite. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> Okay, so I see a lot of guesses and we were correct with snake. So snakes can eat an animal that is two to three times the size of their own head. This is an incredible ability and it also allows them to go a long time between meals. Um, now snakes are also incredibly helpful for people that grow crops um, and, and agriculture. They keep a lot of the rodents that eat our uh, grains and things like that away from our food. So they're a great animal to have around. Okay, now our next animal can pick up prey that is half their body weight with their feet. They're also impressive. They fly completely silently and they are kind of gross because they will eat their whole prey and they'll regurgitate the stuff they can't digest. I see a good guess already. Do we have any other guesses? Nailed it, it is an owl. Okay, they are incredible flyers. They can see very well at night and they are completely silent when they fly. Now this gives people the impression that they're spooky or maybe that they have a bad omen associated with them. Some people see owls as very wise, but these adaptations are really just for allowing them to see in the dark and allowing them to hunt animals with good hearing. So flying silently, being able to see where it's very hard to see makes them incredibly stealthy hunters and really nothing more. 
all of our stories and things associated with them are really just human made. Now I have some very special biofacts with me and biofacts are animal um, artifacts of sorts. Now luckily these are feathers so we are able to have feathers uh, from animals from birds <laughs> without ever having to harm them because they do shed them just like we shed our hairs and things like that. Now I have two special feathers with me today from the zoo and they were uh, generous enough to um, lend them to me to use. Now this is from a blue and gold macaw. You can see the, how they get their name uh, from the blue and gold pattern. Thank you, Kim, for turning my share screen off. I forgot about that. Um, and I also have a feather from a snowy owl. So if you've ever seen those beautiful white snowy owls, just like Hagrid in Harry Potter, this is one feather from that bird. Now, if you'll notice up close, we have two distinctly different colored feathers, but their shape is also very different. Now this owl feather is a little bit looser, a little bit fluffier than the macaw feather, this parrot feather here. Now that's because owls use that fluffiness to keep them silent. So there's an experiment you can do at home if you wanna try this out. If you take your hand and you cup your fingers together like you're going swimming, you wanna catch all the water possible, and you flap a gust of wind in front of your ear, you should be able to hear it, kind of hit your eardrum a little bit and catch the air. Now that's what this macaw feather does. It catches as much air as it possibly can because those feathers are stuck together very tightly. But if you take your hand and you spread your fingers wide and you do the same thing, you'll feel the same amount of wind hitting your head, but you won't be able to hear it nearly as well. And that's what the owl feather is doing. Now this is displacing the same amount of air. It's allowing them to fly and catch the air very well, but it's keeping their, their wings silent as they fly. So they are these perfect, perfect little stealth fighters. That was hard to say. Perfect little stealth fighters at night that are hunting their prey. It's a very, very cool ability to have. Okay, now we have one last animal that we're going to get to before we end our program today. And that is, ooh, a helpful animal. This is an animal that eats animals that can be pests like mosquitoes. So we mentioned pests like rodents for the snakes, but this is an animal that helps eat things like mosquitoes that we don't tend to like to have around. This is an animal that also can lay a thousand eggs at a time. So one female can lay as many as 1,000 eggs in one time. This is also an impressive animal. They use their big eyeballs to help push food down their throat. So they're able to move their eyeballs. Maybe they have an odd shaped mouth. Okay, now I see our chat is getting some messages. Let's see what we see. I see spider, I see bat, frog. Okay, let's see what we have. Frogs and toads. Now there are a lot of myths associated with frogs and toads. Uh, the biggest one is that toads can give you warts. And I'm here to finally put that myth to an end. Toads cannot give us warts. Warts on humans are transmitted by a virus that toads cannot carry. Toads have warts on their bodies that secrete um, toxins. Now those toxins can be irritating to people. Um, and some frogs and toads can even secrete toxins that might be deadly to people. But no frog or toad carries the virus that gives humans warts. So that's a, always a myth that is associated with them. And we tend to be afraid to pick up a toad or a frog because of things like that. But they're actually great and very cool animals. Now, if you were ever to consider touching an amphibian, it's always a good idea to keep your hands very wet because their skin is permeable. Now what that means is it has a lot of tiny holes that let moisture come in and out of their body um, constantly. So they always stay around water, as you may have known already, and that is why. Now frogs and toads are great animals to have around because they do eat a lot of bugs, especially bugs that are considered pests like mosquitoes. So if you don't love uh, getting bit by mosquitoes, maybe you're a little squeamish around frogs and toads, maybe this helps you like them a little bit more. Now I wanted to go back to our snakes because I did have a myth I wanted to talk about with snakes as well. Now a common misconception with snakes is that all snakes are dangerous, but that's not actually true. Fewer than 10% of snakes in the world 
carry a venom that is dangerous to human beings. Now, another good thing to remember is that when snakes bite, 70% of all of the time snakes bite, they are doing a dry bite. Now, that includes venomous snakes. So what that means is when a venomous snake strikes at you, seven out of every 10 times, they're not even engaging their fangs to inject venom. They're just using it as a warning. Snakes do not like to fight people. No animal likes to fit, fight something that is much bigger and more dangerous than themselves. Snakes tend to use a big kind of image to scare you away so that they don't have to fight you. So that's a very important thing to remember. One more thing to remember about snakes is that there are 46 species of snakes in Missouri alone, but only five of them are venomous. Now, this can make people nervous when they don't identify a snake because there is a certain amount of chance that you wouldn't want to picture, pick up this snake. So if you're not sure about an animal, it's always a better idea to leave them be before considering picking them up. That's my recommendation from the experience I've had making videos about snakes recently. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to go ahead and get into our Q&A section. Kim, if you wouldn't mind putting up that enjoyment poll for people to fill out, and I'd love to hear all of your feedback about how we did today and um, any tips on that. Now, I have two questions in the chat. I see, what is your favorite animal that is considered dangerous? Ooh, now that's a great question. Now for today's purposes, I'm gonna say a bat. Now bats are very cool animals. They're very complex creatures. Now this is a full skeleton of a bat from the zoo. I was fortunate enough to bring home with me. Now you can see this, a very complex skeleton. They're very delicate, but people associate them with death and disease and a lot of danger. But I'm here to tell you that bats are incredibly complex fragile and, and just incredible animals. You can see even with such a teeny tiny head, their brain is capable of deciphering and interpreting messages that even ours is not capable of. They are very, very cool, um, agile and talented animals that I have a lot of respect for because they also do a huge impact on the mosquito populations. Um, I also have one more question in the Q&A that says, what is your favorite kind of frog or toad? Oh, that's a great question. Ooh, now I'd have to think about that for a second. If I'm going to give you an answer quickly, I would say the African bullfrog. Now, to my knowledge, that is the largest frog alive today. They get over two pounds. These frogs are humongous. They're just like our bullfrogs at home, but way bigger and way lumpier. <laughs> now those animals are incredible because they can live underground buried without moisture for long, long periods of time. And when they come out and the water finally appears, the males actually do a huge amount of the parenting, which is very unique for animals like amphibians um, in general. So very special animals. If you ever want to learn more about them, I highly recommend doing some research online because they are very, very cool. Okay. Oh, and I see one person has a, uh, they want a ball python. That would be a very cool pet. Uh, ball pythons are really special. Uh, definitely do your research before you ever consider getting any pet. There are certain drawbacks to every pet. It's always a good idea to make sure you can take care of them. That is all the time we have today, unfortunately. Thank you all for joining me. I had a wonderful time talking to you all. If you ever have any more questions, uh, we will be showing a slide at the very end. Um, kind of reminding you some of the contact that you can reach out to for those questions. Um, also remember that the zoo is opening on June 13th and you can go online to our website, stlzoo.org to reserve a time to visit. Now you will have to reserve that free time to visit um, ahead of time um, due to our new services. It's always a good idea also to remember your mask. We will be requiring those when you come back to the zoo. So that's why I'm wearing mine today. Until next time, take care, everybody, and thank you so much for tuning in.